let me say what an enormous pleasure it is for me to welcome uh, Canon Gideon, who is one of my favorite people in the world. Uh, he is uh, an absolute delight uh, in every way and also an example to all of us, uh, remarkably courageous, uh, but also with a wonderful sense of humor and of humanity. Uh, he, um, as you all know, is from Uganda, uh, and I'm sure you'll give us some insights into your story. Um, but he's now, for, for reasons as yet com not completely determined at the University of Birmingham, uh, where he is uh, doing, I think, his 15th degree of some kind. Um, but in any event, <laughs> Uh, we are delighted to have him here. Well, I didn't introduce myself and I didn't even welcome you properly, but I'm Catherine Marshall and I have two hats. I'm uh, a senior fellow at the Berkeley Center and a visiting professor at Georgetown. And I'm also the head of the World Faiths Development Dialogue, which is um, an NGO that grew out of the World Bank and George Carey, uh, Archbishop of Canterbury's determination to try to bridge the gulfs between the worlds of religion and development. And I mention that because uh, Gideon was one of our early uh, partners uh, in this endeavor. Uh, the Berkeley Center, uh, you're at Georgetown University, even though it doesn't look like Georgetown University here, and I gather you had to come in a police car. <laughs> uh, but uh, it is the um, Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. It's uh, six years old, uh, and it was created to come in, come in, please. Uh, ah, there. Uh, it was created to um, try to bring together the different departments and threads in the university uh, that work on religion, but also on peace and on development. So over to you, Gideon, and your mic, right? So you can do. Friends, it is an honor to be here tonight with you at uh, Bacardi Center for religion, peace, and world affairs. And I want to say a very big thank you to Catherine and her team who organized and led to make this possible. And also to thank you for being a friend uh, and affirming my ministry and our ministry. And uh, being a friend to faith. Uh, I know you are a woman of faith yourself, but affirming us in public is in a, you know, could be seen as a, a counterculture where I see many voices in Washington saying faith has no value but to see uh, a center uh, which is saying no we want to study faith we want to identify we want to see how we can uh, harness faith to do more and do better in development in health in international relations and issues it's a very very important um, we used to have a song in, in Christianity which said, what a friend we have in Jesus. And these days we sing also that, what a Jesus we have in friends. So I want to thank you very much. Uh, I, when I see across the board, I see Karen and George, I see Tom and many others who have really walked the journey with me and uh, uh, for affirming me. The talk tonight, uh, as you can see, is uh, focusing on, on three things, on uh, AIDS on one side, the young people in the middle, and the church on the other side. And we are saying, how can the church or people of faith work in a way that restores agency and power back to young people? For what reason? so that they can be leaders in helping us to achieve a world without AIDS. Uh, the question you may want to ask is, so why are you talking about that? Because uh, the background, as you have heard, uh, I'm a teacher by profession, a pastor by calling, and a theologian in training. And uh, I was thrown into this AIDS ministry, you know, violently by a sudden death of my wife in 1991 and then when I tested I, I was positive but 
the way I heard people talking about my status and hearing the way they talk about people who are positive introduced me to an, an area where uh, I discovered that there were so many issues that we are not being talked, up, talked about in the right way. Uh, and so that made me go deeper into my faith and uh, to re-examine what the church is doing well and what the church could do better. And I discovered soon that actually when we talk of the church, and I want to say this to make the context for my speech today, we should be clear of what, which church we are talking about. Uh, because we are two, ty two types of churches. There is the church that is using AIDS to control young people. And there is a church that is, use that is working with young people to control AIDS. And those two are not saying the same things. They are not doing the same things. They are not, their messages are different. Uh, and so, even as we talk about HIV and AIDS, young people in the church, uh, let's be clear of which church. Uh, we, are talk we are talking about the church that is working with the young people in and outside church to uh, control HIV. And the main th thrust of the talk is that uh, the first group of church that uh, works with people to solve problems, that has always been at the heart of the gospel. That has been the mandate, the, the, the divine mandate, call it, the spiritual responsibility. Uh, and, and, and AIDS just comes to remind us of, of what we should do. So you will have Someone should have made you this uh, a sheet of paper which is alone. And that, in a way, summarizes my, my, my talk. Uh, uh, I think it is this one, Tom. Uh, it's, uh, it summarizes my talk in a way of um, putting the words into a song, into, in, in, into a hymn, into, because uh, these days the, 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 the music, the church, uh, the, 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 the hymns have replaced the catechism. We no longer uh, enroll uh, the six months of catechism and people cram things. You know, the spirituality people live uh, comes from uh, people. So when you read this, you will find that it summarizes the things that I am asking the church uh, to do. The green sheet of paper, which has many colors, uh, summarizes the campaign that I'm leading. Uh, it's called the SAVE campaign. The SAVE campaign is a campaign that was started by religious leaders living with or personally affected by HIV. Uh, at first, uh, we used to have to approach HIV and AIDS using the, the entry point of ABC. That is what we had to fight AIDS. And you would hear many church people say, if you can't abstain and you can't be faithful, use condoms. Of course, some people would not write, would put a small C, you know. <laughs> uh, you know so... Uh, um, but uh, the women, we, many women in Africa challenged us and said, we, and the young girls said, uh, we don't think that this ABC is going to work for us. And we said, what do you mean? They said, every time we want to abstain, our abstinence choices are not respected uh, by our male spouses, our male friends. And even when we are faithful in marriage, we are still infected on the marital bed. And when we choose to, want to use condoms, the, the men don't want. So none of the options really is in our control. So we were, and then there were the children who were born with HIV, who also came and said, we are abstinent, we are virgins, but we are HIV positive. And, and then came issues of mother 
to child transmission, preventing mother to child transmission. Uh, then there came the issues of health care in uh, infrastructure, research saying that if you are a doctor in Zambia, you are 15 times more at risk of being infected than a doctor in France, uh, meaning that there was a lot of non-sexual transmissions happening in Africa, and we needed to find a, a message of addressing that. Uh, then there were, of course, the, the people who are positive who are saying, uh, even when the condoms are there, we cannot use them because we are so stigmatized that every time we pick, want to go for a condom, they say, oh, these are the people who have failed to abstain. Those are people who have failed to be faithful. Uh, so we designed a new way of looking at this thing, and we said, if you want to restore agency to young people and help them to become agents for change and uh, restore power, you reduce CIDIM, which is in uh, that song I've given you, and then you do another one, you multiply, save. So that is the save, save campaign, which is summarized for you there. Sidim is stigma, shame. The shame leads to denial. The denial leads to discrimination. This, those are four lead to inaction. People do nothing because they tend to think this is not our problem. This is a disease of prostitutes, uh, truck drivers, homosexuals. So, we have nothing to do with this. So, but others who attempt to do something, they do it wrongly. We call that misaction. You know, when you, uh, you, you've taken a flight you know, to go somewhere, uh, like to Nairobi uh, from Washington, and then after 12 hours of flight, you see a, a, a poster saying, welcome to New Jersey. You know, um, you've, you've done something but it has not produced what you wanted it to do. Now, this safe is safe practices, and we are very clear that the safe practices are not vertical. They are horizontal, that there is no practice that is better than the other. It only depends on which context you are. It's like you cannot say an airplane is better than a car. Or you cannot say a car is better than a boat. No. They serve different purposes uh, according to where you are. So abstinence could be a very good option for people who are single or have chosen to remain alone or, you know. But if you are, they are announcing in church that you are getting wedded tomorrow, then you should know that the abstinence strategy is going to fail on your first day of marriage. So <laughs> otherwise people will say, no, you have not consummated the marriage, so we are get us, bring back the certificate. So you should be thinking of, after I have graduated on, from abstinence, what am I going to do? I will test, uh, and I will use condoms, and then I will remain mutually faithful, or I will use condoms. So PMTCT, safe blood, as you see them on your uh, issues. This one is access to treatment and nutrition. Voluntary, routine, and stigma-free counseling and testing. And this one is very, very important, empowerment. Empowerment of young people, empowerment of children, empowerment of men, uh, empowerment of families, communities, and nations that are AIDS challenged, that are vulnerable to the epidemic. Uh, so, I think even if you forgot everything else I've said today, uh, just if someone said, how do you restore agency to young people in order to make them AIDS competent, then you say, you reduce the sedium, you multiply the save, and you produce AIDS competent, spiritually empowered, gainfully skilled, productively employed, social justice sensitive young people who are leaders and, are in, and, and can help their countries and communities uh, to engage AIDS. 
So, let's page two. Let's go to page two. And you will find there uh, an introduction to say, my paper is arguing that there are two things we can do as, as people of faith, leaders of faith. We have the theological, ethical, and spiritual resources we can engage. But we also have the practical resource, the programmatic policy and uh, um, messaging. Uh, so the introduction is giving you an overview of what are the challenges. And challenge number one, I'm putting it as most people than ever before are living with HIV. You know the statistics, you know the numbers, uh, um, and that is a theological issue. That is an ethical issue. How do we keep these numbers of people alive? That's the first question. The second question, of course, is why does it seem that the people who are living with HIV AIDS are in certain genders, in certain regions, in certain geographical locations, and you know, in certain, why is it? Could there be a problem structurally that probably these are the most marginalized, most stigmatized, most misunderstood populations uh, in our group? The second uh, issue I am raising is that every year, AIDS challenged families, communities, and nations are losing 1.8 million people to death that are postponable, preventable, reversible, and controllable. Now, that's a theological issue, which you could note down for future reflection at the center here. Because every time we talk about death, we, we talk about death as one. But in reality, death is not one. There is death that is preventable. There is death that is postponable. There is death that is reversible. In 1998, I nearly died. I lost 20 kilograms of weight. I had less than a hundred CD4 count in my body. Millions of copies of the virus. In the doctors, when they said, saw all the symptoms, they said, Maximumly, he will live for six months. Maximumly. I had a TB, I had herpes zoster, I had, you know, all the symptoms you can think about except probably meningitis, but pneumonia, as I had, all these things. Uh, but because some generous young woman from California, uh, Lisa Cover, intervened and began looking for medicines here and there, I am here giving a, a talk in 2012. Uh, if there hadn't been an ARV intervention in 1998, I would be 14 years in the grave. So what happened? My death was reversed. It was postponed. And in many countries, like Swaz uh, Switzerland and others, uh, Norway, um, even here, you know, where the lifespan is now 78, 80, and others, most deaths have been controlled. Of course, we all have to face the question of inevitable death. So theoretically, we have not solved this one. Now that uh, whether you are a pope, whether you are a president, whether you are, you, you, we all face inevitable death. But the theological and ethical challenge we have around issues of AIDS, Catherine, is that the tragedy is not that people are dying, no. The tragedy is that people are dying of preventable, postponable, reversible, and controllable illnesses, infections, that could be dealt with. I was in Switzerland in, uh, in, Switzerland in 1998 uh, during the of I think it was the Torovs or something, um, International AIDS Conference. And uh, the, 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 the minister of health stood up and said, before I make my speech, I want you to congratulate us that uh, 
we have defeated the virus. What do you mean? Uh, first, we have, in terms of treatment, we have closed the AIDS clinics. There is no Swiss who is ill enough to be hospitalized. So all of them have returned back to their work. So we've closed the AIDS clinics. That's number one. We clapped. And then he said, in, she said, in terms of infection, we have reduced the new infections to three per year, not 30. And so it, it shows that there are things we could do that could prevent the death, but also the infection. So that is the ethical issue. Why do we still have infections and illnesses in some parts of our communities, in some genders, in some age groups, in some sexual, uh, sexual sexuality groups, uh, you know, as you know them. Number th issue number three is about do we have the willingness because you could have the, the resource, but are you willing to, to put the resource into, um, into play? Because there are two issues here. Is AIDS refusing to go away? Or are we failing to make it go away? So there is, ethically, there is a difference between refusing and fading. When AIDS challenged communities don't control the virus, are they refusing to control the virus or are they failing? Do they have the accurate information? Do they have the appropriate attitudes? Do they have the skills for programming, for communication? Do they have supportive environments? Um, those of you who were in an earlier uh, presentation, you heard how some, someone from Africa was defending uh, the laws Africa has, that no matter what come, whether there is AIDS or not, they are not going to change the laws. So do people have supportive policy and legal environments in, in which they can practice what they know as safe, as heresy, as... Uh, um, so that is an ethical question we have to continue uh, thinking about. Number four challenge uh, is, that, uh, is that of restoring agents and power to orphans and other vulnerable children, that we still have cultures where people think that uh, young people are not entitled to accurate information. Um, and they will, they, will, they will not be given accurate uh, knowledge. Uh, in in my, some of my cultures, even when a child asks, where did I come from? They say, you were bought from hospital. Um, <laughs> uh, why shouldn't I sit on a fireplace? Because your father will die. Hey, why don't you say it's because the fireplace, something can burn you? Uh, you know, why, why don't you... Why don't we want to say the truth? So restoring the agency and the power to orphans and young children means that we are willing to, to really look at these children as young people, as, as people who deserve the best. If we deserve our best as grown-ups, the young people deserve the best too. Now, let's go to page uh, eight. I have raised the theological, ethical, and moral challenges around HIV and the prevention and the treatment and the, um, that there, is, it, there seems to be more sedim and less safe. And we need to reverse it. We need to say there is more safe than, than sedim. Uh, the stigma and the shame and the denial and discrimination in action and misaction are lower and the safe practices and access treatment and testing and empowerment is higher. When you get that point, uh, you, you, you end AIDS. Actually, I have a formula, and uh, no one has 
come to challenge me about that. I would want Bakari Center to engage me on that to see whether I'm accurate. Because I always say that when you find where effort is less than the crisis, you always find the virus going up. Where individual and collective effort in reducing sedum and multiplying save is less than the AIDS crisis, you will always see the incidences going up, the prevalence going up, and the deaths going up, the orphans going up. Where E effort is equal to crisis, you find the virus leveling off. Uh, Senegal, you know, you've had Senegal being, you don't get a report about AIDS that doesn't talk about Senegal. Oh, Senegal has kept the virus at 1%, two, less than 2%. Yeah, but why hasn't Senegal done better? Why hasn't it gone to zero? Why is 2% good enough? <laughs> so that it becomes a success story, you know, 2%, 2%. Simply because they are comfortable and they say, okay, that's not very threatening. Because the epidemiologists say if you can make, if you keep your, epi your, your epidemic below 4%, you are okay. So Senegal is happy to uh, have 2% of their people, uh, you know, challenged by AIDS. So it doesn't go up, it doesn't go down because the effort and the crisis are balancing. But... There is also another truth that where effort is greater than the crisis, the virus goes down. Uganda is a very good example that when our efforts were very powerful, the virus went down. Where the efforts are relaxing, the leadership is relaxing, now we are being told the the prevalence is no longer falling, uh, it's leveling off, and in some cities like northern Uganda and central, uh, the virus is, is, is going up. So, what theological resources do we have as people and leaders and communities of faith to help in the task of restoring agency and power to orphans and other vulnerable children? I've given issues that uh, the first theological resource is the theological term we call Monsieur Day, that uh, we don't start mission among orphans and the vulnerable children, we only follow God's mission. I have come, you know, when you read Exodus uh, chapter uh, 3 from 7 to 10, you see God saying, I have heard your cries, I have seen your suffering and I'm concerned, and therefore I have come to deliver you from that suffering. So it's God's mission, uh, Monsieur Day. Um, in Isaiah 65, 17 following, you see God saying, I'm creating a new earth and a new heaven, and the suffering, the cries will not be more. And there's something I like most in that verse, uh, in verse 20, and he says, um, verse 20 says, uh, no infant shall not live out his or her days. And to die at a hundred, you will be considered young. <sighs> it excites me to say, yeah, have we, the life expectancy for God is a hundred. We've not reached there. So... <laughs> uh, to die at 100, you'll be considered young. And uh, so when you see Uganda having 42, Zimbabwe 39, uh, I, I always tell people that uh, when the, in Japan, when someone is becoming prime minister at 78, uh, the Zimbabwean has died twice because they 39 years and the other one, you know. So. Um, Monsieur Day challenges us that if God has declared AIDS to go, we, we have a theological responsibility, a missional responsibility 
a spiritual, you cannot say I am spiritual when you are not working out God's, God's work. In John 10.10 10, he says, I have come. The thief comes to kill, rob and destroy and have come that they may have life. And one of the theological issues probably which we've not discussed very well in our theology is to, to unpack who is that thief? Who is the thief? Is it waterborne diseases? Is it gunshots uh, you know, by violent police? Is it genocide? Is it HIV? Is it malaria because people don't have mosquito net? Who is that thief? We've not really engaged with that verse to say, God is saying the thief comes to kill, rob, and destroy. But for me, I have come that they may have life and have it in fullness. That thief, we have to unpack it. Is it bad laws, humiliating laws that are not respecting human rights and human dignities of people? Then we also have the doctrine of creation, which uh, is, is saying uh, this is something that probably is difficult for the Muslim uh, uh, people of faith to engage with because they don't want uh, anything that talks about the image of God and, and so forth. But for us in the Christianity, we say man and woman were created in the image of God. And if we are created in the image of God, we carry the dignity of celestial beings, of spiritual beings. And therefore, anything that devalues us, anything that uh, sickens us should be fought uh, left and right. And of course, that ties in with 213, and uh, then we end with the divine, uh, we also have the divine justice that the Bible continually reminds readers that God takes sides. God is not neutral when it comes to issues of justice. Uh, of course, God loves us all, yes. But God loves more, more the people who are made vulnerable, people who are sinned against. God loves them. Because the God being, the he or the she, God, realizes that these people need more support, more help. So the divine justice is a principle that could help us to engage. And finally, uh, belief in God. This one is becoming into disrepute. Uh, many people are saying belief in God is unreasonable. You cannot be intellectual and believe, believe in God. But for us who are intellectual and also believe in God, it's still a very powerful tool to know that uh, we have uh, a God who we believe is creator, sustainer, and redeemer of the universe. And uh, this God endows us with the knowledge and the intelligence um, to do things that can make life easy. When you look at this sheet of paper he gave you, verse number two is affirming that, that uh, there is no reason why we should be dying of AIDS now because God has given us the science. God has given us the science to prevent new infection and to treat the positive for prevention and long life. Oh, precious is the truth that treats, prevents, and hopes in God. Nothing else that we know Nothing but a comprehensive response. So that belief in God, to know that we are not left as orphans, that every challenge, God provides solutions. Sometimes I, ask, I challenge my hearers and say, don't you see how God loves us? That in the first five years of the epidemic, we had already isolated the virus. We had known that it does not spread by air, by water, by, oh my God. You imagine if we are still struggling to say, how does it move from one person to the other? It would be terrible. But we now know it is semen, it is vaginal fluids, it is breast milk, it is blood. 
and it's not just semen, it is infected semen, infected, but, you know, and you, once you have that uh, scientific resource, then you say, okay, so if it is infected semen, I have two ways of doing it. One is I don't share the semen at all, or I use a condom to make sure that the semen does not mix, or I take the medicines that will knock the virus out of the semen. Game down. What are the practical resources? We in the faith, we have what we call the reach that uh, we are there where the infections happen at the community level, at the family level, so the reach. We have the presence, uh, the, the presence, we are with the people, we are with the young people. Um, we have the audience. Every church you enter, you find the Sunday school, you find the uh, young peoples, then you find the women and the men, you find the politicians in the church, uh, you know, we find the, both genders there. Very few politicians have that uh, privilege. When they are uh, addressing people, maybe taxpayers will come. Uh, or those who are eligible to vote will come. But in the church, all age groups are there. We could put that resource to good use and package programs for each, for young people, for children, for uh, we have programs which we call Daughters of the King where we are training young, young girls to say no when they mean no. So that the other person who is trying to force them into unsafe sex uh, recognizes what they are up to. And, and the no, you say it in a way that does not lead to your loss of a boyfriend or girlfriend or that you are misunderstood or you are beaten. Even women those who want to introduce safe sex in their marital life, we are teaching them through church groups to negotiate for safe sex within the marital context. We also have the sustainability. We were there long before the PEPFAS and the Global Funds and the World Visions and all these people came and probably we will be there long after they've left. So we've always been telling the best way you can use the resources for PEPFA, for Global Fund, for World Vision, is to empower the churches and the mosques and the temples, whom you know that they will be there when you have uh, exhausted your, your, your allocations. And we have of this whole tradition of, of, of care and compassion and uh, AIDS is not the first disease where the, the churches are displaying um, support to, to the suffering and the needy, and it's probably not going to be the last one. But why, if we have all those resources, the theological resources, the practical resources, why then are we still AIDS challenged? That's a good uh, question. The first one I'm saying on 3.1, on page 11, is that uh, there are capacity issues, isn't it? <laughs> capacity issues. Uh, the first time I met Catherine, I was telling her that, you know, sometimes uh, our, we as religious leaders, our enthusiasm is not matched by the competence. So you really want to do something, but <laughs> the skill is to do it. <laughs> um, Recently, I was asking Karin, I said, but everywhere I go, they say Gideon is doing a good job. You know, they want to hear my story, they want, but if I'm doing a good job, why is my organization always resource constrained? Could it be that I don't have fundraising capabilities? I don't know how to write proposals. I don't know how to market and pitch myself. Uh, you know, what is it? So sometimes the enthusiasm is not matched by competence. In, how, in which areas? In probably about seven or eight areas. One, policy formulation. Two, strategic planning. Three, practical programming. Four, messaging and communication. Do I 
package the message the way I would want people to hear. Five, partnership building. Do I have the necessary partnerships uh, around me? Five, resource mobilization. Six, resource mobilization and allocation and budgeting. Seven, research and publications. And probably that's where you are very powerful and you are, you've been helping us as, as faith. And uh, eight, prayer. Prayer is a, you could say no one challenges us, but the question is, do we know how to pray? Do we know how to pray? Um, Jesus said that there were these two people who were all praying, and one was saying, thank you, I'm not a stupid guy like that one, I'm not a sinner like that one, I'm not, eh? And then the other one was saying, I'm so sorry for the sins I've committed. And he said, of the two, who was praying well? So it means that actually there are people who pray, and they don't pray well. In Africa, where I come from, there are two types of prayers going to God. There are those who are praying that AIDS kills more people. Thank you, God. We had always talked about people being abstinent. We had always talked about people being faithful, and they have always refused. Now, God, you have brought this disease. Could you kill many more? so that people can understand that uh, personal morality, if you fail in morality, you have consequences to go with it. Eh? Those prayers. And so when you are talking of a, a rapid vaccine, they say, God, don't bring a vaccine. If they have a vaccine, they will sin so much. Eh? When you are saying, oh, why don't they use, oh, don't bring condoms. They will sin without being infected. Eh, you know, that type of thing. And of course, there are others who are praying, God, do anything, whether it is a vaccine, whether it is a cure, anything that can stop this infection, these deaths. So do we know how to pray? We may be praying, but are we praying the right prayer? So I'm talking about capacity issues. Then we have differences in scriptural interpretation and application <coughs> that even when people are reading the same passage, the interpretation becomes different. One interprets, interprets the passage to preserve life, to enhance life. But another one may interpret the same, same, same message to take away life, to threaten life. So we have two types of theologies on the ground. Life threatening, life reducing, life-taking and life-wasting theologies. They are there. And then we have life-defending, life-affirming, life-enhancing theologies. But all of them are using the Bible to, as their spiritual base. At my master's program, I, was, uh, I, I, I did uh, uh, a, desk, a, a library research, and I got two theologians. Both of them professors, both of them on African campuses, one in Nairobi, another one in Botswana. Both of them had the same title for their book. Uh, one was AIDS, the biblical solution. And the other one was A, the HIV AIDS Bible. So all of them had a Bible. <laughs> all of them were using the Bible, but they were arriving at different conclusions. The the Nairobi one was so stigmatizing. The Botswana one was so compassionate. And I was saying, so what is happening here? So George was asking me, why are you doing a PhD now at your old age? And I was saying, I, you know, I am. I didn't say old age. <laughs> <laughs> I was saying, no, I want to examine. Uh, because my research uh, theology, my research topic is, do, could our God image influence our theological frame? If I look at God as a judge, does that influence the way I do theology about people who are positive or the countries that are positive? And if I look at God as love, does that, you know, so that's my research topic. It's coming from what I did before. So the differences in scriptural interpretation. 
valuing appreciation of AIDS issues as being integral to spiritual, religious, and faith practice. Up to now, there are people who still look at AIDS as a health issue. That's a health issue. Minister of Health should handle. They don't see how you cannot be spiritual, you cannot be theological, you cannot be pastoral without engaging in HIV. They look at them as totally separate issues. So we are at different stages of that. And of course, we have increasing sexualization and aggressive atheism, which says, don't, don't put your money with religion. Those, those, those are a bunch of bad people. They don't know what they're doing. They, um, uh, you know, state money should not go into faith. And, you know, uh, so even when we are struggling to put our houses in order, uh, to understand AIDS and put our theologies in order, there, are, there is a group saying, no, 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 don't deal with those people. And uh, that uh, challenges us. So it is in that context that uh, Gideon has been doing a small few things to, to say, if we have the resources, spiritual and theological and practical, and we have these challenges, what can you as a small boy of coming from Africa and you are positive and you are affected, what can you contribute? First contribution I had, I set up a small chapel. It's called Bishop Samuel Chapel. I wanted to have a place, a small place, about 50 worshippers where people can come and worship in a way that is AIDS competent. So the music, the liturgy, the, some, the sermons are all AIDS competent. And now if you visit us, uh, one of the researchers came from Bakari Center and visited that chapel and, and met some people there. So if you, it, just to show the world that there is a way you can be church that is AIDS friendly or is AIDS competent. Two, I set up what we call the Africa Network of Religious Leaders Living With or Personally Affected by HIV which has now actually grown uh, beyond my expectations now because uh, last week they were telling us that there are now 10,000 people uh, in more than 40 countries. When I started, there was only one, and then we became eight, then we became 40, now I hear there. Of course, we are not happy that so many religious leaders are infected, but we are happy that they are able to stand and use their adversity to transform it into service. And then finally we have the, uh, the Hope Institute which is devoting its life to training young people. When they were introducing the, the president for Georgetown at the earlier uh, event, they introduced him as the man who is heading an institution that prepares young people for leadership. And I said, wow, this is great. And so how do you prepare young people for leadership in an AIDS-challenged region where millions of people are positive and you cannot look at the face and say, this is one is positive on this one, where there is gender violence, where the health infrastructure is run down, where the politics is such that people don't care how many people die as long as they they retain themselves in office and so forth. There should be a way of bringing training people. So the Hope Institute is saying we need to have five schools. The School of Vocational, Technical, Agricultural, and Environmental Sciences. So that people have the, pr the practical schools. They are not looking for jobs. They are creating the jobs. The School of Community Health and HIV, so that they can have the concept of community health issues, the productive health issues, sexual health issues. The School of Business and Entrepreneurship, so that if they have a skill, they can go on and establish a business of their own. School of Transformational Leadership and Development, uh, to make sure that they are leaders in their own families, in their own communities, and finally, the school of religion, theology, and philosophy, so that they can have the resources we are talking down. 
uh, uh, we have been talking about. Thank you for listening. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm so glad that we are continuing to engage. And uh, I will be happy that uh, this partnership continues, knowing that sometimes my enthusiasm is not matched by the competence, that you can help me to be better and do more. Thank you very much. It was, um, as always, a great joy to listen to you. And 15 minutes grew to a bit longer. But I know Rabia has to leave, and she's obviously raring to ask a question. So we'll it's let true. you go first. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Canon Gideon, as you know, I've known you for over two decades. And I'm always in awe of your effervescent enthusiasm uh, and uh, commitment and dedication. I want to ask you, how many of the religious leaders you meet in your day-to-day -day life can talk the same talk and walk the same walk as you. Because it doesn't matter what we commoners think or do. We can be blue in the face talking about AIDS. But really, when in faith-based situations, what really matters are faith leaders like you uh, <coughs> and other clergy. So how many have you converted? Let's not talk about your university of this or that or that. Let's talk in practical life, how many have you converted who can be just as enthusiastic and as knowledgeable and as dedicated as you are to tell, not only in international conferences, everywhere, so that aid can be turned around. The second group of people, as you've rightly put it, can be youth. They are the future. And how many youth have you trained in small groups or individuals who can say the same. I'm not challenging how many you, but I'm just challenging you more so that tomorrow you come and you bring an army with you of youth and religious leaders who talk the same language as you. Thanks. Thank you. Your, your mic. Oh. <laughs> um, I've already talked about the religious leaders who are living with or personally affected by HIV who are more than 10,000 now. Uh, but also, when you look at this summary, there is a, the strategic objective, number one, is to have 150,000 faith leaders in 23 countries trained in the competency you are talking about by the end of 2016. So, and 150,000, we hope, will generate 70,000 congregations, and together we'll do much better. And of course, the orphans, uh, the output is still small, but I'm not the only one uh, in this field. Uh, there are the World Visions, there are the Compassion Internationals. We are all working together to bring an army of, of AIDS, competent, uh, and social justice uh, uh, oriented young people. But I, if I can push you, because I have very much the same question. I, I have to say I was shocked at something, because in a way I haven't worked as much on HIV AIDS in the last few years as, as um, five years ago. And I happen to be going through the sort of UN AIDS summaries, AIDS <laughs> alert, the UNGAS reports, and a variety of others, doing word searches for religion, faith. And there's almost nothing. I mean, there's one mention in each of them. So it seems as if, in terms of the partnership, religion is still viewed as as much of the problem as the solution. Mm -hmm. So I think the question is, we know there's progress, and we know there's a core of dedicated people. But how how is the balance shifting? I think the balance is shifting gradually as many people who are not necessarily religious leaders choose to blame religious leaders less and support them more. Because sometimes what we say and what we do that is wrong or that is inaccurate is not because we intend it. It's because we lack the communication and the programmatic and the conceptual framework uh, to, to, to understand these things. So 
the more we get people like you and uh, others on this table and be and outside who say these religious leaders who are AIDS challenged need help. They need less blame and more help. Uh, then we can do more. There are some of us who do a lot of work, but we, we don't. We can't even package it. We can't. Uh, you know, if we can't tweet, we can't Facebook, we can't uh, even produce a newsletter. Because that is not what we have, that's not our tradition. Our tradition has always been, go do the work and God will bless you. Not go do your work and show to yourselves what you are doing. No, that has not been. But the world now says, no, in order for you to be known, in order for you to be recognized, you have to publish, publish or perish. But that's not our... Uh, our core competence, we've just been doing our work, helping the sick, without even, the Bible says, if you can do it without the right, the left hand knowing that the right hand has done it, fine. But now the world says, no, tell us how many people have you treated, how many people have you supported. That's not our area of competence. But if you work with us, we, we can really do better. There is something as easy as this that shocks me every time I present it to, sh to show that really the church leaders need help. You know, I draw a simple diagram like this and I say, I ask people, the religious leaders said, what is the opposite of good? Of course they say bad. What is the opposite of right? They say wrong. What's the opposite of rule? Lawful. They are quick to say unlawful. How about faithful? They are quick to say unfaithful. I say okay. And do you is there another English word that is called safe? They say yes. So what is the opposite of safe? They say unsafe. Quickly. And then I say, hmm, that's a very interesting. So could there be people in your congregation who could be doing bad things which are also unsafe? They say, what do you mean? I say, like they steal your water and then they don't boil it. They say, oh, those are many people. Hmm, could there be another group that does the right thing in a very unsafe way. And they say, what do you mean? I said, like, they buy their water, they don't, see it, they don't steal it, but they don't buy it. Oh, those are many people. That's why we have a lot of typhoid. Oh. And could there be people who are doing it right and safe? And they said, yeah, there are many. And could there be people who are doing it in a bad way or in a sinful way, but in a safe way? What do you mean? I mean, like, they steal your water, they boil it. They drive your car, they don't crash it. They sleep in your bed, they take a mosquito net. They said, oh, we hadn't realized that. So, but because when AIDS came, religious leaders thought that AIDS is being caused by this. The only thing you need to do is teach people to change from this to that. But that is not the, the valuable. You need to help people move from what is unsafe to what is safe. These ones take you to heaven. When you do move here to here, you go to heaven. <laughs> but if you do the right thing in a very unsafe way, you go to heaven at the wrong time. You cause traffic jam in heaven. And, uh, and they laugh. And then I say, but if you do this and this, then you go to the heaven at the right time. You've paid the government taxes, you've raised your children, you've... So, you know, they say, oh, we wish you had come here earlier. <laughs> we wouldn't have made mistakes. I was in Swaziland and they were saying, oh my God. So, such things, accompanying religious leaders to have a new language of looking at issues differently and appreciating that there are different paradigms of reaching the truth could be helpful.
could you talk about what you do when you travel to these countries to um, get the governments to change their policy and what are the issues standing in the way of the policy change in Uganda which is still sticking with the ABC usually what when I go like recently I was invited by President Kabira in the DRC and then I was invited by the, the, the government of Kenya it, it's again to help them see that there is a difference between and the safe behaviors and unsafe environment. That safe behaviors cannot happen in an unsafe environment. Where you don't have cultural, religious, economic, political environments that are supportive of safe behaviors, you can always talk about abstinence, talk about faithfulness, talk about condom use, but people will not adopt the behaviors. You need a supportive framework, a supportive policy, legal, cultural, infrastructural environment that helps you to adopt the safe behaviors and practices that makes them popular, that people want to do them without being policed and their routine while doing the opposite for the unsafe ones. So I help people see. Then I see, I help them do what I've done here to show that, yes, we started off with the ABC because there was nothing else to say at that time. Surely the ABC was the best we could say at that time. There was no treatment, there was no testing, there was nothing. So the best you could say is, is please abstain, please be best. But now we know that we have to talk about testing, we have to talk about treatment, we have to talk about other routes of infection and prevention. But the governments, some governments are stuck on what they worked before. Now, governments also should realize that although the epidemics start in small vulnerable groups, you know, like men having sex with men or commercial sex workers. Time comes when the virus spreads uh, into the general population so that it is no longer helpful to continue focusing your messages uh, on those three groups when actually the virus is no longer there, <laughs> but it is in the general population. In Uganda, the commercial sex workers have less infection rates compared to mutually faithful monogamous uh, people. So you need to change your messages and the programs according to how the virus has shifted. Now Uganda is a victim of success. That uh, if you have been a professor in a university and uh, it, is, it is the work that has given you success and fame and international if they say oh there is a way you can make money by uh, working on a farm, you would say, mm -mm, that's not, uh, you think, that doesn't work. Or if you have made a name by selling water and they tell you, no, you can make more money selling pancakes, you may hesitate. Uh, you know. So, because you know that there is nothing that brings money than water. The same thing with Uganda. Uganda got international recognition and respect and awards because of the ABC. Now the epidemic has changed and it, it needs them to change. They have to talk about biomedical uh, practices. They have to talk about structural interventions. But they are fearful of saying, wow, wow. But if we change now, shall we get the same success like you got? Uh, it's like if you have a Catholic professor who has earned his name in writing sexual ethics in a traditional way. And you tell him, you see, AIDS now requires you to modify some of those sexual ethics issues. They, they may take time to engage, to say, well, I think I hear you are saying, but give me time. The same thing with Uganda. Actually, when we engaged them, they said, we hear what you are saying, 
But instead of moving away from A, B, C to save, I think what we can do is to write A, B, C plus. So when you re read uh, some Ugandan books and you will see there that sign. And the question now is, but what does plus mean? Oh, it means A, B, C plus other things. But who is going to be there in the local village to explain the plus? Probably they are going to see it as a cross. Why don't you unpack what you want to say with the plus to say we are talking of PMTCT, we are talking of safe blood, we are talking of safe injections, we are talking of safe circumcision, like we are doing in safe. If you want to say treatment, you mention it. But they are so scared that Professor Ted Green, who helped them to be famous, is still there and is still saying ABC works, so, and they can't challenge him. So that's where we are. We need prayers. As far as I know, with religious people and um, spiritual people, is that all people make mistakes. And if it is, in fact, the case that a person transmit the virus and zero converts to HIV, and they were, in fact, a Christian, we should um, move away from the assumption that they were bad people, uh, which is Partially, uh, the reason I want to um, respond to the theological resources that you've outlined here, I want to know what is your opinion on the belief that God is omnipotent and HIV exists, uh, and are you supportive of the idea that HIV is a part of God's divine order for humanity, and the people who have received or a diagnosis of HIV, it was already in their predestined plan for existing here on Earth? First response. Okay. And my last only concern is that uh, I have a, a slight disagreement with the belief that, or and it's hard to be religious and pessimistic, but I have a slight disbelief that HIV and AIDS has is going to end in our lifetime. Um, I'm hopeful that it will decline in many ways and in many populations, but I feel that we should be really focusing in the movement for HIV and AIDS to effective access to treatment and more um, prevention drugs and prevention vaccine officially. Thank you. The safe sex teaching, in my opinion, is flawed in very ways. It, it works, but m people who transmit HIV most of the time use the condom at least once or twice. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, those are very important questions. The way Americans here define safe sex, for me, it's different, so I will not go there. But in Africa, it means if you can do your sex in a way that the dangerous body fluids do not mix with yours, that becomes safe sex. And there are two types of safe sexes. One, no sex. Two, what I have already described, that if you, there is a way, you know, and people know. You don't even have to tell them to use condoms. Just tell them uh, semen, blood, Vaginal fluids, breast milk are the dangerous body fluids. And they are not stupid. They will know what to do to make sure that the semen doesn't mix, <laughs> the, 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 the vaginal fluids doesn't mix. Um, but each culture is entitled to their uh, thinking. Sometimes uh, I have even always, uh, I don't know whether the religion, uh, the back of the center can take up this challenge. I have said, by the way, if condom is the problem, why don't we change the name? Because for us in Africa, a name is very significant. When I tell you I'm Biamugisha, it means blessed one. When you hear someone say, I am Sipo, it, it means his gift. When they tell you, I am a manze, it means he was born in a certain... So a name 
is significant. So what is condom? Apart from raising people's Christianity is a, uh, you know, raise bros. Maybe we change it to concern. So that when I go in a shop and I say, give me two concerns, and they, I say, why are you buying two concerns? I say, because I'm concerned about myself and my spouse. It makes sense. But you mentioned condom and people, spirituality. Now, what type of spirituality kills a person? What? You know, a person like me, I got tested in 1992. 1995, I married again. I did not produce children intentionally for seven years until 2001 when there was prevention of mother-to-child transmission. Now, if that is not being spiritual, what is it? Because I could have, imagine 2001, 2003, I have two children within that space of two years. From 95 to 2001, no child. So what happened there? There was a way I was having sex with my wife that was not leading to producing children because we didn't want to infect our children. Is that spirituality? Is that being unreligious? You can tell me that. Uh, is AIDS likely to end in our lifetime? Uh, I have a book here, written by me, Faith to Save Lives, Africa's Families. Now, Jesus gets this woman who has an issue of blood for 12 years. And the woman does things, you know, courageously does things, many things, and finally she gets the courage to say, I will touch you. And Jesus looks at her and says, Woman, your faith has saved you. Your faith has made you well. He meets this man born blind, Batumayas. And Batumayas shouts, Ah, Jesus, I want to be well. And people say, Don't, don't disturb the past. You know, the guy is busy. No, I want to be well. And but Jesus looks at the guy and says, your faith has healed you. In my context, I tend to think that when we talk about faith, again, it's not one. Like, death is not one, faith is not one. There is faith that kills, and there is faith that heals. If a faith is increasing stigma, is increasing shame, denial, discrimination, inaction, and misaction, know that that faith will not liberate the world from AIDS. It will increase the deaths. But if we have a faith that reduces the stigma and the shame and the denial and the discrimination and challenges people to test and to know their status and to disclose to partners who should know for self-protection and for protection of the kids and they have the face that makes sure that mothers do not get positive and those who are positive give, get the prevention of mother-child transmission and the governments put the money where it should be and is utilized well, why shouldn't we see the end of AIDS in our lifetime? Why? So it will, again to answer your question, it will depend on the faith we are putting on the table. There is a faith that kills, there is a faith that heals. Uh, is AIDS a divine plan? Again, that's a theological question. There are people who believe in predestination, uh, but for me, I really don't believe that God hates Africa so much that uh, a population that does not make up 12% of the world bears 90% of the deaths and 90% of the orphans and 70% of the new infections. So God is deliberately wiping out the black race if, if, 
you know, so why did he create us in the first place? We should have. So I don't believe in, like the young lady said, I don't believe you. Yeah, I also don't believe in predestination, especially if it is a predestination to die. I can, I can believe in a predestination to, li to life. Like Jesus says, I have come that you might have life. But a theology that says women, like when you get all the virus in women, the African women take 80% of that virus. So to, to have a theology which says God is deliberately targeting African women or women of African descent, wherever they are, that, that theology is tough for me to accept. The children, the children, that an American child here is no longer at risk of being born with HIV, most of the children. In Africa, in Uganda, 28% of our new infections are from a mother to child. To believe that God is deliberately targeting Ugandan children, ha, huh, that's tough theology for me to, yeah. to take. Yeah. Okay, we're getting late, but there are two people who've been waiting. So let's hear the two questions. Thank you. Gideon can put us all right. Hey, one thing that you've alluded to, sort of, has been that there are many different faiths and beliefs about AIDS in the world. And I'm just wondering, especially from an African context where there are so many indigenous beliefs, what role does interfaith dialogue have to play in combating AIDS on such a grand scale? Is anyone else burning, by the way, with the question? Julie, did you? Well, thanks. Um, my question is, um, focus on the theological resources that you talked about and especially creation and the Imago Dei and in when we there's a theology of sex uh, in, of some kind embedded in our understanding of creation and so when we talk about um, something like safe sex if, if by safe we mean how to avoid the HIV virus it makes perfect sense wh what you're saying if we take the theological view of that sex is part of how God made us and for pur certain purpose in certain ways and so forth, uh, it actually could be quite dangerous to have safe sex uh, if we in fact are doing something that's going counter to the way in which our Creator made us and, and would that not then be a confusing message to people to talk about, at least in a church setting, to talk about safe sex but that's still going against God. Isn't it always unsafe to go against God? Okay. Um, there is a theology which says every sexual act should be open to two things, procreation, and self-expression of love. And when I read that piece, I say, oh, wow, this was really a very wonderful piece of theology. I mean, God sent. And uh, when you read, again, church history and say, why did, why did the church evolve such a theology? Then you discover that actually, the theology was designed at a time when the world was unpopulated. So the church had the responsibility of encouraging people to produce, especially at a situation where the chances of dying as a child was much. So in order for you to have 10 people and you, 10 children and only three survive was uh, to be backed by that. So, and then the second one was guarding against selfish sex, you know, where people just have sex without love involved. So it was a too, a too good piece of uh, theology. 
But that theology comes into trouble when you say every sexual act must be open to procreation without necessarily saying, every, without necessarily implying that every sexual act must be open to HIV transmission. Because where the child passes is where the virus passes. So we need now to find a new way, as you rightly say, of balancing, keeping the principle, and at the same time opening up the new realities. In 1998, I was giving a public lecture in Geneva, and I gave the example of a pope who was due to give a sermon, and he couldn't, he couldn't give it. Why? Because they had put the same principle in, 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 his, in his sermon. And the cardinal, he, you know, was surprised that the Pope is not coming when, and he had never been late, by the way. When it was nine, he would be there to deliver. Nine fifteen, he's not coming. Nine twenty, he's not coming. So the cardinal goes to check, and what a father, what is happening? My son, I cannot come. This thing you put in my sermon. And the, whole, and the cardinal looks, and it is exactly that statement. Every sexual act must be open to procreation and self-expression of love. And the cardinal says, but this is what we have always written in your sermons, and you have always said it and preached it without complaining. Why are you complaining now? And the pope says, yeah, that was before AIDS. But now how do I... My infallibility does not allow me to say things that are untrue. How do I say every sexual act must be open to procreation without implying that every sexual act must be open to HIV transmission? And the cardinal says, so what do we do? And the Holy Father said, change the sentence carefully and prayerfully. Huh, like what? Like, Every sexual act must be open to procreation, except in situations where the mother is already positive. So you could keep the principle and bring in the new reality. The, reality. the last one was on the interface dialogue, and that's a very good question, that sometimes we get so fixated with our own theologies and, and uh, concepts that we forget that there is a, another paradigm. For example, uh, the Jewish, the Muslim, and the Christian faiths are the ordinary ones that have the concept of God as, mo we call it monotheistic religions. But there are Many other religions that don't have that um, concept. What they have is being true, being honest, being uh, leading a, a selfless life. And, you know, is there a way what we can learn? Because sometimes um, we use God to kill people. We use God to, to humiliate people. Right? Yesterday I was reading uh, something where uh, this a, a woman was being flogged in Indonesia, uh, you know, and when they flogged, so because that they had caught her in adultery, but it was really not adultery. It was that they found her with a man. So, but no one knew. So they flogged the woman, and she passed out. So when they were carrying her to hospital, <laughs> uh, many things happened, and so someone sent the. And then I wrote behind, below the subject, I said, huh, she, was, she was being caned in the name of the most merciful, yeah. mm -hmm. the most gracious, <laughs> and the most compassionate God. Yeah. So, so you always imagine, if, how do we <laughs> turn religion as a boxing rather than a liberating thing? So I think interreligious dialogue really could help us to to, to, to think broader and say, hey, uh, India 
uh, was yesterday, but one was telling us that you, you always look at your God as a, as a he. But for us in India, most of our gods are female. And look at that image. Suppose we had an image of God as a female. That caring and uh, uh, loving aspect, you know. So I think there are many things we could learn from interreligious dialogue, uh, approaching. I always tell people that the, the truth is one, but it has many dimensions. Hmm? And there is an aspect you can get from revelation, you can get from tuition. Uh, Catherine comes and teaches you and you get the knowledge. You can get it from reason. You can get it from tradition. This is what he was said. But there is an aspect of truth that you will never discover from any of this except from experience. It will always remain hidden to you. Like now I'm left-handed. If you're not left-handed, you may never know how left-handed people feel, how they work. Or oh, I'm now positive. If you're not positive, you mean, you know, I have lost my wife at a very young age. So if you have not been in that experience, you can read about that. You can, but probably you may even never know the whole truth. The same thing with religion. If you are not from another art tradition, you may never get that uh, dimension of truth that will always remain hidden to you until you have experienced it. Thank you.